The Lord be with you. As you're turning to Jeremiah 23, I am mindful if my, my friend Wanda was here, Wanda Green, she'd be whispering over my shoulder, follow that preacher. <laughs> and so, Jeremiah chapter 23, I'll give it a shot. Verses 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Will you pray with me? And now, O Lord, we pray for ears to hear. Ears that hear your words, not mine. Your words that call us, that shape us, that convict us and encourage us. Help us, God, to hear them now through the words of Scripture, in this time as your Spirit moves among us, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, a long, long, long time ago, in 1963, Bob Dylan released his album called The Free Willin' Bob Dylan, and on that record was a track titled Masters of War. The first time I ever heard that song, it wasn't Dylan who sang it, but Eddie Vedder, the lead singer for one of my favorite bands, Pearl Jam. If you listen to Dylan's song, Masters of War, if you listen to those lyrics, they are aimed at someone, directly at those people who were in power in the 60s, those people with money and influence, those who were often the driving forces behind wars and military conflict, particularly in the 1960s, which drafted young men into combat, putting them in harm's way while the wealthy elite stayed at home and reaped the benefits of such bloody conflict. And in case you've never heard that song, here are just a few of the the lines from the fourth verse. You who fasten all the triggers for the others to fire, then sit back and watch when the death count gets higher. You hide in your mansions while young people's blood flows out of their bodies and is buried in the mud. The next year, in 1964, Dylan would release The Times, They Are a Changin'. You probably have heard that album, or at least the title. But on it was a song titled Only a Pawn in Their Game, a sort of musical tribute to civil rights activist Medgar Evers, who was assassinated the year before in Jackson, Mississippi. In that song, Dylan didn't lay the blame solely at the feet of those who shot Evers. In fact, he doesn't mention them by name at all, but instead placed the blame squarely at the feet of those southern politicians who in those days used fear and ignorance to influence poor white folks to vote for racist legislation and enact violence towards people of color. In both of those songs, Masters of War, Only a Pawn in Their Game, Dylan was, yeah, a counterculture musician. But he sounded an awful lot to me like the exiled prophet, the one overlooking the shambles of Jerusalem as it lay smoldering in the wake of Babylonian might. Dylan echoed the truths that the prophet Jeremiah proclaimed in the early years of the Babylonian exile. That in the end, the the people's heart, yeah, the people's hearts turned from God. But why? 
Because they're leaders, they're kings, they're priests, they're governors, they're shepherds, had not sought the way of righteousness, the way of God, but instead sought for themselves power, wealth, and self-adulation. Our passage, this reign of Christ, Christ the King Sunday morning, the last Sunday in the liturgical year, this passage before us begins right after the prophet Jeremiah has words of judgment directed specifically for King Jehoiachin, the king of Judah who basically just left the place in shambles and allowed Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to come in. And this passage continues the prophet's theme of judgment aimed at those who were over the people of Israel. You heard it, right? Woe to the shepherds. That's not the people out in the field keeping the varmints. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says Yahweh. It is you who have scattered my flock, you who have driven them away. You have not attended to them, so I, says the Lord, will attend to you for your evil doings. Rather than aim his words at the people, like so many of the other prophets have done, rather than do that, the, the prophet Jeremiah has words barbed, for the nation of Judah's leaders. They were supposed to be the ones who who led Judah in the paths of righteousness. The ones who would call the people back to God whenever they were tempted to stray. Those kings, those priests, those tribal elders, they were supposed to be the ones who exemplified what it meant to live by the law of God. Lives lived in line with the commandments of God, of Mercy of justice. But instead, they use their inherited positions for personal gain and comfort. They use their powers to oppress the poor, to exploit widows, to malign the strangers, to gain for themselves even more power and more wealth. And all at the expense of their people and their security. Because they knew, they heard long before Jeremiah, the other prophets, the other prophets who said, the day of the Lord is coming. It's coming. And the Babylonians are right outside our doors. But they didn't listen. Now Jeremiah stands among them in exile and declares that God's judgment has fallen on them. And while, yeah, there'll be a remnant who are going to get to go back, A remnant who will go back to Judah. A remnant who will go back to Jerusalem. We read about them under Ezra and Nehemiah. They go back. They build a new temple. They establish the wall of the city. They'll go back. But not the leaders. They will die in exile. Jeremiah's words are harsh. Most especially if you find yourself on the pointed end of them. And I can hear, maybe you can too, what, what folks might say these days at the prophet's words, right? Amen, Jeremiah. Woe to those leaders who don't do the will of God. That's why we have to vote, you know, for people who will. That's why we have to have leaders who will stand up for God. Amen, Jeremiah. Woe to those shepherds. And those voices aren't wrong. They're not. We should do that. We should find ourselves electing, voting for people who share values important to us, who will act the way we think a God would want us to act. But that's not what we're talking about. I'm not sure that's all of what Jeremiah's words have for us. No, I think on this reign of Christ Sunday, as we're staring down the hall at Thanksgiving, right around the corner is the Christmas season, I think the prophet's words might need to hit a little closer to home for us that they might be words we need to hear. Those of us, well, those of us who are less likely to call ourselves kings and queens and shepherds of the people. Because, you see, the text from Jeremiah this morning doesn't just leave us with Jeremiah's prophecies against kings and the leaders of Judah. No, there are some words of promise as well. The Lord says, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of the lands where I have driven them. I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, and none shall be missing. For the people of Judah, 
God still had a plan for them to prosper in the land that God had promised them. God was going to raise up new shepherds. God was going to raise up new shepherds, and under them, the prophet declares, the people will no longer be afraid, and they'll flourish and thrive. And that's the thing. God is the one who will bring it about. God is going to accomplish it all, and he's going to do it by a promise he made to David. A promise that before the exile really was just sort of like on the books about who gets to be king in Jerusalem. But during the exile, it swelled into this prophetic prediction. And so Jeremiah says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. The inverse of that being the other kings didn't. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That's what he says. These days are coming. He says that sometime around, oh, I don't know, 575 maybe. Standing there in exile, everybody wondering what happened at home. And Jeremiah says the days are coming when God is going to do all of this. And now here we are, on the other side, with Christmas trees in some of our living rooms. Mariah Carey singing to us about all she wants for Christmas on the radio. List laid out for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and Why'd I Buy That Wednesday. (laughs) We're looking forward to shifting into holiday high gear once we put all the, the dressing and the turkey and the ham and aluminum foil and Tupperware, sticking it right just so in the refrigerator. We're anticipating carols, ugly sweater parties, candles, silent night, communion on Christmas Eve. We know. We know the one whose name will be called the Lord is our righteousness. They're all wondering, who is it? Who is it? We know. And we're all but ready to hang the green and welcome him into the manger. We know he's coming because he's already been here. Already heard the little drummer boy. Already smelled the shepherds. He's already met the magi. He's already preached his sermon on the mount. He's already healed the sick. He's already raised the dead. He's already been crucified, dead himself, buried and raised on the third day. And we are all in the likely enviable position of being on this side of Jeremiah's word, this side of Judah's Babylonian exile, where the Lord is our righteousness, having already shown up to show us the way, the one who the fourth gospel calls the good shepherd, leading us all back into the flock. So what do we take from Jeremiah's words into these joy-filled, hopeful, anticipatory days ahead of us. Well, I have a thought. While you and I may not be like the priests and kings of Judah, in the epistle, the first epistle of Peter, we are called a priestly kingdom. And we may not have the power and wealth to lead and manipulate a nation, But you and I as kingdom priests are in the position to show others the way. And there is no other time, I'm convinced, no other time of the year when eyes of others are so intently trained on us than right now. So what does that mean then? It means that during this week of Thanksgiving... Folks are watching to see if those of us with so much for which to be thankful are truly living lives of gratitude and generosity. Or if we're simply looking for another opportunity to complain. Another opportunity to gain something. Another opportunity to want more. It means that as we enter into the Christmas and the Advent season, that folks will be watching, because it'll happen, you know it does. Every year about this time, it gets cranked up. Starbucks didn't have the baby Jesus on his cup. They, they, they said happy holidays at Walmart. 
Folks start saying, Jesus is the reason for the season. When you say it, folks start listening to see if you believe it. They want to know. They'll be watching. You claim Jesus is the reason, you better celebrate and revere that season for that reason. They want to know, are they doing that or are they simply seeking a pious ploy to set themselves over us who they deem spiritually inferior? We're not kings with crowns on our head, but we are a priestly kingdom leading folks. And we can either lead them away or toward the cradle of Christ. No, you and I are not kings, not queens, but we are leaders. Whether we want to be or not, whether those who are following us, watching us into this coming season of hope, peace, love, and joy, those who are following us like sheep behind a shepherd to see where they're going to take us, where their words, where their claims going to take us. Will they take us to the cradle of Christ? On to his cross? On to his redemption? Or will they just lead towards more of the same old stuff? More of the empty, self-seeking materialism that the weeks ahead are going to throw at all of us. As those who follow Christ, those to whom others look when they want to know what it means to follow Jesus, will we lead others in the paths of God's kingdom? Or will we be like those to whom the prophet Jeremiah speaks? Those who sought only what was best for them. That's the challenge before us, I think as we gather with family, as we gather with friends, as we begin to proclaim, maybe louder than ever, Jesus. What will we lead people to? By our actions, by our lives, by our convictions. Will we lead them to Christ? Or will we lead them into exile? Christ calls us into this season of thanksgiving to live lives of gratitude and generosity, on into Advent and Christmas to live even deeper lives of gratitude, generosity, and love. Folks are watching us. Folks are following us. Where are we leading them? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, the one called the Good Shepherd. Lord, we know to call on you is to be redeemed, to be saved from ourselves. But Lord, we also know it comes. It comes with a it comes with the joy of your service. And Lord, we know we'll fail you. God, I know I do. But Lord, we pray that you give us the strength, the courage to live lives that show others who you are. That in these coming days, in these coming weeks, as eyes turn to those in your church, Lord, that we show people lives of gratitude and generosity. Lives ultimately, Lord, lived in the fullness of your love a love that seeks to be born into this world, a love so strong that death itself cannot stop it. So Lord, now as we spend this time listening to your spirit, we pray, God, that you move among us, you give us the courage to respond to whatever it is you lay upon our hearts. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.